gathering together in one place which might be a big threat to our health. In Ibulunjibuansi week, a series of activities have been conducted, including planting trees. Brian Tumwinebiaruhanga, Andrew Sebira, UBC News. <laughs> Makere University is to put more emphasis on spiritual devotion for a holistic, godly relationship in the next 100 years. This was confirmed by the institution's chancellor, Dr. Ezra Suruma, during a corporate prayer breakfast meeting organized by Pastor Robert Kanja, the lead pastor of Miracle Center Cathedral at Makere University Freedom Square. Makerere University, the oldest higher learning institution in Uganda, Thursday commemorated 100 years of existence at a function presided over by President Yoweri Kagutam Seven. <laughs> Just after the celebrations, Friday morning, the university's top management attended a prayer breakfast meeting organized by Pastor Robert Kayanja. The <laughs> Faith, the line of hope. The line of joy, the line of working, the line of believing that there is more in God. Chancellor Makere University, Dr. Ezra Suruma, loaded Pastor Kayanja for blessing Makere University for next journey in education service. In honor and joy, we have not only the presence of the president, but the presence of God in Makere University. The blessing, it's a wonderful thing that we have done, and I have no doubt that not only will Makere benefit, but you too will be blessed because of the wonderful things that we have done. And to call upon the Holy Spirit to guide the future hundred years of Makere. Professor Banabas Nawangwe, Vice Chancellor Makere University, committed honoring God at the institution in the next century. I want to believe that as we enter the next 100 years of Makere University, we are indeed going to put God first in everything that we do. Put our trust in God that this university can become even stronger, become even better in the next 100 years. It is therefore very important that we have these activities that are honoring God. The patron Miracle Center Cathedral Church is Pastor Robert Kayanja asked Makere University management to gazette space for him to build a student center for mindset change. A little place somewhere where we can be a blessing and put a dream center for generations to come. When you are retired or anybody else retired, so that you can continually come to the campus not to disturb the management, but probably to find a student who will be there. A place where they can find counseling, a place where they can find solace, a place where they can come and their dreams before they leave university. I'm Ivan Juko for UBC News. Members of the minds. The independence constitution of Uganda was among the key milestones to Uganda after it getting its independence on the 9th of October 1962. Now since independence, Uganda has been uh, with four constitutions which include the current 1995 independence constitution of 1962, the Pigeon Hall constitution of 1966 and the Republican constitution of 1967. Our reporter Deborah Namamonde looks at the development of the four constitutions held in post-independent Uganda as the country celebrates 60 years of its Golden Independence Jubilee. Before the British shop was gone through, Uganda had three different indigenous political systems. These include the Himakasta system, the Bonyolo royal clan system, and the Buganda kingship system. Buganda being a strategic kingdom and its engagement with the colonialists, it succeeded in acquiring most of the administrative powers, including collecting taxes among other roles, like other territories in East Africa which were colonized. High courts and appeal courts were established. These include, among others, a special commission to perform executive, 
legislative and judicial powers. In 1955, Uganda became a constitutional monarchy with a ministerial government based on the British model. And in 1957, political parties emerged and direct elections were held. And when they saw the force with which they came to colonize us, they saw that they could be defeated. They, they turned us into a protectorate. On 9th October 1962, Uganda welcomed its newborn baby, the independence, with a constitution which was highly influenced by the British governance model. The constitutional conference held at Lancaster House in London on 18th September 1961, witnessed the constitution that was called the Independence Constitution. The conference was attended by representatives of colonial administration headed by Sir Frederick Edward Montesa, Sir Walter Fleming Coates, the then governor of Uganda, the Democratic Party, Milton Obote for Ugandan People's Congress, UPC, among others. The representatives were elected by district councils. But they chose them and took them to Lancaster to, to, to put a stamp. When they came back, I think it was agreed that there would be elections. The constitution comprised of distribution of powers, though it alleged the exercise was unjustifiable. It also provided for cabinet, parliament, and defined powers of major government organs, civil service, and judiciary. The amendments in the constitution introduced a ceremonial president to replace the governor general, and it's from here that Kabaka Mutesa became the first president of Uganda. Because they wanted independence, no more delay, okay. The issue was, when we reach home, we shall sort it out. Unfortunately, before they even sat down to, to sort it out, already there was a problem. In 1966, Apollo Minuton Obote deposed Mutesa's government and declared himself president. He also abrogated the independence constitution by introducing the interim constitution, also known as the Pigeon Hall Constitution. Because of the marriage of convenience originating from the way they made their constitution, the foundation was pa. They drafted the, an interim constitution which preserved the kingdoms. On 8th September 1967, a constituent assembly from parliament drafted a new constitution that named the Uganda Republic. They were not intending, it, it was the intention was not to make Uganda spring. Well, just to leave Buganda State. Buganda says that we had our institutions, we had our government before the British came, and we agreed to become part of Uganda as a province. Now you say you want to become a district, we want us to become a district. We don't want to be a district because that means uh, div dividing the kingdom. Although the system of government had some democratic aspects, the democratic principles were hardly observed in practice, which also saw Bote getting rid of kingdoms in his government. He wrote a letter in the Uganda Herald in which he appealed to the British to delay Uganda's self-government until all the districts had reached Uganda's development. And the cause of the problem was that Motesa was the only person who stood up against Obote and wrote to him to warn him that his actions were going to cause the country a lot of problems. In 1971, General Idi Amin Dada apprehended power by overthrowing Militon Obote while in Singapore for a Commonwealth meeting. Obote used um, Amin to cross the Kabaka and Buganda. And Amin realized that he, he was the one keeping Obote in power. So he started getting big ideas, I think. And two, it's alleged that some foreign powers used him for their own purposes. In 1979, Amin II was overthrown by a combination of Uganda and Tanzanian forces. And Yobota was again elected president in 1980. When Amin came, he said, for him, he didn't bother building Uganda on the constitution. He just went at the side and built it on nothing. Definitely the army was given the best cream or used the army to harass people. 
used the army to appoint its officers into government positions. Four years later, General Tito Okelorutua overthrew Obote's regime in a military coup. However, in a string of an I a year later, the National Resistance Army in Nara, led by UN Museveni, that was fighting the regime for years, deposited Tito Okelorutua's government. But, to his credit, I mean didn't do anything without involving the law. Whenever they, he made a pronouncement, his uh, civil servant would go and work out a law to implement it. In 1986, NRA, now NRM, came in power. There was an election. Obote's party stole the election. And before the election, Yoweri Museven, President Yoweri Museven now, was the leader of one of the political parties which participated in the elections. And he warned Obote that if you, if you dare steal elections, we are going to go to the bush and fight you. And then, later on, Tito Rutroke overthrew Obote. Aiming at coming up with a new and a strong constitution, the National Resistance Council in RSC was enacted, and later the Constitutional Commission was formed in 1988. Those were the basic questions. What is a constitution? What does it contain? And why do we need one? In December 1992, Ugandans preferred a constituent assembly directly elected by the people. We came back from there. We now structured, I think, the training materials on which top topic subjects we are going to discuss. They are the people who said, but our main challenge in this Uganda and why we have built Uganda is because of those leaders who do not want to leave power peacefully. The process of the constitution was highly participatory to reconcile the society, democracy, Law of land to stop the misuse of the state power. They said if we can have, if he can lead us for two terms of five years. The other question we asked them, so should we also limit the term for the members of parliament? They said no, they, they, we remove them ourselves because we have powers to remove them. On September 27, 1995, the Constituent Assembly finally approved the new constitution. We didn't know that the parliament would be constituted by Gride. You can amend, depending on what challenges it has faced. For the Minister for Lands, Housing and Urban Development, Judith Nabakova, has challenged all stakeholders engaged in the housing sector to ensure that all Ugandans are considered and catered for as Uganda moves forward to avail quality shelter to its citizens. Minister Nabakova was presiding over a week, a one-week housing symposium organized by a Habitat for Humanity Uganda. Words and the theme of our conversation today remind us of the fierce urgency of bridging the inequality gap. A one-week housing symposium has been opened. The event organized by Habitat for Humanity Uganda in line with the commemoration of the World Housing Day has been opened by the Lands Minister Judith Navakova. A number of slums are coming up. Remember, as a country, we have increased even the number of cities. And I don't miss again another proven fact. Housing is one of the industries, the sectors in this economy, in this country, across the globe, that has got a long value chain. We want to provide decent living. Habitat for Humanity has come up with an urban home that can be built in an urban center for people who are staying badly, are living uh, badly. So we are working with them to identify again those communities in these slums in the Buganda Kingdom. You heard the minister speak, we have added more 15 cities in this country. That is even going to exacerbate the, the challenges around housing, the challenges around basic services. Our population is growing at a rate of about 5.2%. Our slums, our urban settlements are growing at a pace of 
Navakova notes that her ministry is looking at avenues to help the housing industry. We are also discussing issues of probably extending incentives to people who are investing in this area. Can we look at maybe giving land to people who do all manufacture materials that are used in construction? She asserts why government needs to support the housing sector. Evidence has clearly demonstrated that whereas housing is a human right, it is, an, it is economic in nature and that it forms the foundation and sustains for socio-economic development. Mr. Nawakoba, however, is saddened by the fact that many low earners continue being dumped into slums at the expense of creating better shelters for the rich. Majority of our population need low cost housing to live decently. Government is also inviting investors to develop slums. So when you look at our NGP3, we are talking of a slum upgrade. And the slum upgrade, we are coming with two versions. That these people who have a lot of money and can put up decent but costly uh, accommodation can take one part of that slum and then the other part of the slum is developed into still decent uh, condominium flats which can benefit the poor people. Namuganza was officiating at the closing session of the one week long symposium. We are trying to see that as Uganda we are not left out of the picture because uh, we are having 2.2 2 million deficits. Uh, of houses in Uganda, but when it comes to the affordable ones, it's even much higher than that figure. So I think that's what we are going to do as government, and already we have started the symposium. You have seen that uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity and other development partners have been at the center of World Housing Day is annually celebrated to create awareness and appreciate the need for everyone to have a better place they can call a house or home. Robert Onyango, UBC News. As you pay Mpola Mpola for this smartphone, make calls, update your WhatsApp status, watch YouTube, and Google anything under the sun with 2 GB worth of data every month for 7 months. Simply make a small deposit of 99k and pay the balance Mpola Mpola. You can pay in daily, weekly, or even monthly installments while you enjoy your new phone. So what are you doing today? Visit any MTN shop near you and get the MTN Kabode Super Easy Easy. At Timex Nutrition Center, we advise you on the right foods to eat, exercise profile to adopt, and lifestyle strategies which are compatible to your blood group and genotype. This empowers your body to prevent and treat many diseases like diabetes, blood pressure, arthritis, ulcers, obesity, and many others. For more information, find us at our head office in Kampala on NASA Road, Conrad Plaza, second floor, or call 0758-819-952 or 0778-288-361. We also have other branches in Bara and Ginger. It's Freaky Friday from Airtel. Buy or gift. Buy or give. Get freaky too. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to load a Freaky Friday bundle for you to enjoy the best offers on voice and data. To buy a bundle for friends and family, dial star 149 star 10 star 5 hash. Freaky Friday with Airtel. Buy or gift a bundle today. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to get started. Airtel, the smart. Smartphone Network. Fellow Ugandans, did you know that we are losing wetlands at an alarming rate? Wetlands are the most threatened ecosystems 
disappearing three times faster than the forests. Dear ones, we risk losing species to extinction and a lot of wetlands at maintaining our environment. Let us all be concerned, conserve and restore our wetlands. In the name of God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Water and Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, Uganda National Meteorological Authority, in partnership with the Interreligious Council, with support from Government of Uganda, Green Climate Fund and the United Nations Development Programme. Welcome back from that break. Now, Uganda Broadcasting Corporation is set to deliver informative programming related to Paris Development Model, the new government strategy to deliver public and private interventions for wealth creation and economic transformation. Now, a team from the Paris Deve Development Secretariat met with the management of Uganda Broadcasting Corporation and agreed on a number of areas regarding information dissemination on PDM. All right, we'll be getting back to that story in a bit. Now, the Minister for Gender, Labour and Social Development, Peter Amongi, has called upon the Equal Opportunities Commission to create means of ensuring that gender and equality prevail in respective government institutions to curb on imbalances across the country. Minister Amongi communicated this during the launch of the Equal Opportunities Annual Report on the State of Equal Opportunities in Uganda at a function held at the Office of the President here in Kampala. 55.1% of the complaints received and registered by the Equal Opportunities Commission as per promoting equal opportunities for all in the country were successfully resolved by the Commission. This is contained in the ninth annual report launched by the Equal Opportunities Commission on the state of equal opportunities among government institutions, departments and civil society organizations across the country. The report is aimed at redressing imbalances for the financial year 2021-2022 and ensuring equal opportunities among Ugandans. Uh, always uh, our reports have thematic areas and this year's thematic areas were in the areas of, of transport, works and transport, in health, uh, in access, in trade, that is we looked at access to, to local markets and capital. We found out that uh, their number of women, 3.2% of women, are actually going to TBAs, yet that is dangerous. While launching the report, the Minister for Gender, Labour and Social Development, Beta Mongi, commended Equal Opportunities Commission for the report that aims at creating equity and equality in the country. This report contributes to the promotion of equitable development because this report is very vital, because it is putting pressure, it is telling finance, do this for equity. Gender, do this if we are to achieve equity and equal opportunities. Minister Mong, however, urged the Equal Opportunities Commission to create means of sensitizing government institutions and agencies on how to eradicate gender imbalances. This commission is supposed to put in place mechanism for us to realize a just and fair country, where all of us in this country can have equal opportunity, can participate, can contribute, and can benefit all within the context of achieving development. The chairperson of Equal Opportunities Commission, Hajat Safia Nalule Joko, highlighted the achievements of the commission in the last financial year. Previously, uh, in our education system, in the rural areas, maybe in Langon sub-region where you come from, you may not have seen so many young children going for nursery education. And yet it is important. So, but with our advocacy, we have been able to advocate for that and to make sure that 
that early childhood education is included in NDP3. Although a lot was achieved by the commission, there were also unavoidable challenges that limited service delivery. It's a problem which actually is coming as one of our emerging issues, the rampant land evictions. Our land is a primary factor of production. And though the government programs like PDM, uh, their success will actually depend on uh, uh, people having land. The ninth annual report of Equal Opportunities Commission was set under the theme Unlocking Socioeconomic Potential for Inclusive Development. Rebecca Nantongo, Susan Nabugude, UBC News. Now, local governments have been tasked to come up with ordinances on environmental conservation campaign to enhance policing for clean and green environments everywhere. This as Uganda is grappling with life-threatening effects of climate change like drought and floods. In a bid to heighten advocacy for environmental conservation, climate change crusaders have resorted to hawking the campaign in institutions of higher learning. Led by Uganda Dialogue Arena, UDA, a section of climate change sensitive organizations has held an inter-university debate at Chambogo University, highlighting the importance of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. The Minister for Education and Sports, Janet Kataham Seveni, was represented by Chambogo University's Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Fabian Nabugomo. I want to applaud our friend Lutit Meta, founder of UDA, for coming up with such an idea to mobilize young intellectuals to develop society and positively contribute to it, and also the organizing committee of UDA and that of Chambogo University. Professor Nabugomu underscored the importance of recruiting young university students for further advocacy of environmental conservation. We must all be involved. We must plant trees in our homes. We must uh, show young people how to manage the environment, how to look after watersheds, swamps, and protect them. We must not just talk, we must act. The best time to tackle climate change was yesterday. So if the, the youth don't stand up now, it's going, to, it's going to lead to very disastrous effects in the future, possibly effects that are even not, 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 not reversible. Frederick Musmenta, the executive director, Uganda Dialogue Arena, notes with concern the increasing cases of environmental degradation, blaming it on poor policy implementation. Musmenta is of the view local governments should wake up from their comfort zone and take charge of environmental matters. You don't need to wait for the central government. You wait the local government. What is the local government doing in those in those districts? Let them be at the forefront of fighting climate change. This is and bylaws, and those should be accompanied by very very punitive measures, strong measures, so that if you got in the wrong, you pay heavily. If the penalty is heavy, you are locked up. You are told to pay a million shillings. Trust me, this person will not do it again. Representatives from partnering organizations also concur with this line of thought. This is when we come in as a development partner uh, to add a, a brick to what government is doing and, and that brick is sort of getting uh, the funding into the country uh, to support uh, groups of this nature. Because uh, it is one thing for people to make policies but it is another thing for society to understand that those policies actually apply to them. It is hoped that at the end of the debate, outstanding views will form part of the recommendations to be forwarded to the environmental management duty bearers. Dokas Kimono, UBC News. Professor William Bazeo's retirement took him to the farm to make a difference in farming with the purpose to impart farming skills to the youth. Professor Bazeo decided to start farming on a one square mile piece of land in Chikangula sub-county Nakasongula district under the Orchards House farm. We have a detailed story. Look at this. From a professor of medicine at Makerere University to a farmer, that is what Professor William Bazeo resorted to immediately after his retirement from Makerere University. Each one is how much? 1.6. What? 
located in Nakasongola on a one square mile of land. Professor Vazeo ventured into fattening bulls, rearing goats, and sensitizing farmers, among others. We thought we would make a difference in farming. Farming with a purpose, farming to bring in uh, new knowledge to the farming sector, to bring in students, farmers, and everybody to learn, and we learn together. Bazeo says farming needs consistency and is optimistic that it can increase income. At Orchard's house farm, there is simple mechanized farming by growing different crops and increasing the quality of meat. It needs to be particular so that you do not just buy chemicals and chemicals and you do not benefit. I personally believe that farming is, is worth doing, farming is profitable, and farming can be good. And it will also help improve the income of this nation. If we have quality crops, quality products, We'll be able to export them. The Orchids House Farm is organizing a field tour to exhibit to people that have supported them and to bring in as many people to learn. Bazeo says the bulls reared here are of good quality and on demand for export. When we do fattening for bulls, we fatten borans, we prepare food for them, we grow food for them, and we fatten them and feeding them our expectation from them is each bull to add on at least 0.9 to 1 kilo per night. And these bulls have quality acceptable meat internationally. <laughs> the field day will be an eye opener with a practical field tour on what can be done in agriculture like feedlot management systems, herbs and species production and mangoes for export among others. Crops that we have been growing in the, in the greenhouses including basil, the umjaja, the commonly known umjaja, which is so marketable all over the world, especially in Europe, and many other crops. Among the activities of the day will be awarding final students with certificates since the farm is a training ground for those who want to acquire farming skills. Sudat Kaye, Zahara Bigaba, UBC News. A number of civil servants in Kalaki district are being investigated over corruption. Among the cases that are being investigated include the 350 million Uganda shillings meant for the rehabilitation of Abakalang Idakaman Surambaya Road. Minister of State for Teso Affairs, Dr. Kenneth Ongalo Obote, made this re revelation while presiding over the ceremony of Teachers' Day in Kalaki district. During the last financial year, the Minister of Test Affairs dispatched 350 million shillings to rehabilitate Abalang Idimakan Surambaya Road in Kalaki District. However, to his dismay, the Minister of Test Affairs, Dr. Kenneth Ongalo Obote, realized there is no value for huge amounts of money spent on the construction of the road. Before it was worked on, we were able to drive about 10 kilometers and then we got stuck. We could not continue. We had to turn around and come back. So the other day we went, after it had been worked on. This time we could only drive for one kilometer, and we got stuck. The road is now worse than it was before it was repaired. The district leadership, however, attributes this to the current torrential rains that have ravaged a number of roads across the country. Because you cannot tell me that, oh, we repaired the road, but it rained. You are supposed to repair the road with rain in mind. It is going to rain. Now, I don't know whether the people repairing this road are the ones who have been causing us famine, because they don't want it to rain. Otherwise, the rain will wash the road. Some of other cases that are being investigated in the district include drugs which allegedly disappeared at Bululu Health Center 3 and bribes taken by the District Service Commission to award jobs. I was only told recently that drugs disappeared in Bululu. They are being investigated. I have nothing to do with it. I am told some members of the District Service Commission were arrested for soliciting bribes. Now if they did that, that is wrong. 
Because when you solicit a bribe to give positions, that is how we get the wrong people in critical positions. The alarming cases of corruption prompted the security officials to condone the district headquarters to pave a way for investigations. It is the question marks which led to the closure so that documents are accessed and we clear those who need to be. Because, you know, an allegation of corruption is a very bad tag to attach to someone. That's why it needs to be carefully scrutinized. Those who have done no wrong should be allowed to live. Minister for Teso Affairs, Dr. Kenneth Ongalo Obote, vowed to wipe out the corrupt officials in Teso during his tenure. But I want to assure you, we are going to turn this district upside down. We are going to stand it on its head and shake stolen money from people's pockets and get it out. I can assure you that. If you steal, we will catch you. We will. Politics or no politics. Who told you that I'm going to stay an MP forever? I am not. But what I do stays on forever. People will remember that. Among other districts that are being investigated in Teso sub-region include Ngora, Soroti, Kumi, and Bukedia. Joseph Oko, UBC. Uganda Electricity Transmission Company Limited is looking for 18 billion shillings to restore vandalized transmission towers of Bujagali Lesos Line, which is yet to be commissioned. The company chief executive officer, Michael Taremwa, plans to adopt monopoles as an alternative to lattice towers, which are highly de on demand in the market. Now, this is expected to minimize the rate of infrastructural vandalism. At least 95 transmission towers have been affected by vandals on the Bujagai Torole source high voltage power line. The project, which was commissioned in 2013, has stalled past initial completion deadline of 2016. So they used to come and take the entire tower down and harvest it within a space of about 30 minutes to an hour. The tower is gone. Now they are cutting a piece, leaving it to fall then they can come at a later stage and, and harvest it. Complications in acquisition of wet leaves delayed the project at different stages, leaving many already mounted towers prone to safety. But because of the issue of right of way, the line could not be completed. The contractor then became bankrupt, they became solvent. Circumstances at the time compelled the transmission body to procure a second contractor to speed up the project after adjusting the construction time frame from 2016 to 1st of December 2022. So we got another contractor to come and complete the line, having resolved the, uh, some of the pending issues. But now we had this emerging issue again, which is worse than what we had previously. So the current date of completion is December 2022. But like you have seen, that's not going to be possible. The transmission company has established that over 95 transmission towers are affected by vandals, where at least 22 totally vanished. The 20 towers, the 22 towers that have been so far taken from here, we have lost at least 5.5 billion shillings. That's at Kakira alone, 5.5 billion shillings. But like we have seen today, that there are more 42 towers that are going to fall. To invest and repair the affected towers will require the company at least 18 billion shillings. Billion. So you look at Kakira and then the stretch to Mosita, we have at least 15 billion shillings that the government is going to lose. But we're not only talking about Kakira and Mosita, we have section from just before Mosita as we're entering here to the dam where we have about 52 towers. Alternatively, the electricity transmission team plans to adopt monopoles to replace lattice towers, which are highly demanded on the scrap market. These monopoles, however, are projected to be costly and will attract new procurement. So ultimately we have to go th uh, to the monopoles option. I think that will be a long-term solution. Because previously we've tried to use cameras on this and they seem not to have um, worked. So we are now looking at all the other options. Uh, you'll see that monopole goes, is about 20 to 30% more 
than the lattice structure. This Bujagali Tororo Resource High Voltage Power Line is a cross-border trade power line investment taking power to Kenya and any economic sabotage directly affects Uganda's foreign exchange and impacts directly on the East African community relations. Abdul Nasseri Lubwama, UBC News. <laughs>
The non wage, the total budget approved is 11.1 trillion shillings, and we have so far released for half year, or by the end of this half year, we would have released 5.8 trillion, which is 52.3% of that budget. Is it now a policy in the government that when you steal money, you are asked just to refund it and then you continue business as usual? I think this really has, is it going to increase corruption in this country that you can risk to steal money as long as you are not caught. When you are caught, then you turn it back. Probably, I think uh, we would like to, to, to hear from you the steps that the ministry is going to take to protect the 500 billion uh, shillings that you, are, you are intend to release for PDM. In line with the government policy on local content, the accounting officers were reminded to ensure that priority is given to procurement of locally produced goods, provided they are certified by the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Dennis Igor for UBC News. All right, with that, we come to the end of our first edition. But do join us at 10 o'clock for our second edition of UBC News tonight. We'll be having more stories. I'm Lorene Masika Kazimoto and Muhammad Mugalu on Sign Language. We will see you at 10. Inspiring Uganda. It's Freaky Friday from Airtel. Buy or gift. Buy or give. Get freaky too. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to load a Freaky Friday bundle for you to enjoy the best offers on voice and Data. To buy a bundle for friends and family, dial star 149 star 10 star 5 hash. Freaky Friday with Airtel. Buy or gift a bundle today. Dial star 149 star 10 hash to get started. Airtel, the smartphone network. UBC, inspiring Uganda. Yes, a very good evening to you tuned into UBC TV. We thank you so much for keeping it with us. And welcome to this week's edition of UBC One-on-One -on -one with Michael Jordan Lukomwa. On the 9th of October, that is this very Sunday, Uganda is going to celebrate 60 years of self-rule. That is independence. For over 50 years or so, Uganda was under the control of uh, the British government and we, uh, we were a Uganda protectorate not a republic for a very long time but on the 9th of october 1962 uh, the union jack was lowered and the uganda flag was raised as a sign to show that uganda was now a country and an, a republic on her own since then it is 60 years and we're going to celebrate on sunday we are going to focus on that and i have a senior leader in this country so we are going to look on the historical path of the 60 years and we're going to look at a few things that we'll manage to look at in this time. This is not his first time on our show. Uh, this is the second time and we are so glad. Join me welcome uh, Dr. Paul Kawanga Semogere. He is the former Democratic Party president and also a senior leader in this country. A two times presidential candidate 